wanting to leave, it's, you know, wanting to sort of further what it is that I've got to say. You know, I think every successful documentary photographer is about, you know, just having something to say and, you know, trying to realize that vision. And for me, my vision wasn't here. I could see it being in, uh, in, in Russia. And as I said earlier, there was, there was a strong connection that I felt, you know, be, you know, growing up as a teenager and watching almost every day on television and hearing on the radio and, uh, you know, seeing in the news magazines such a fascinating uh, period of history with uh, the Soviet Union. And, uh, you know, I guess you could say I was a Russophile, not necessarily, maybe a Sovietophile or something like that, but uh, I didn't necessarily think that I wanted to be in, in Russia, but it just kind of was a natural progression of where, where, where I wanted to end it up uh, being. I first went in winter, December 2004, to Ukraine to cover the Orange Revolution. And uh, at the time, it was the sort of biggest uh, news story. And I was feeling at that time that, you know, I wanted to be this sort of uh, hardcore news photographer or photojournalist, war photographer, and go off and cover some of the larger events. So I, I just went on my own uh, ticket to cover the Orange Revolution. Within about three days, I realized that, you know, I was bored with it. It's just, you know, what I found fascinating is that there was close to a million people standing up freezing cold. And that, to me, was a more provocative question. Why is there a million people? There's got to be a reason for this. So I needed to go find what that reason is. I don't want, it's, you know, sort of a cause and effect. And uh, I wasn't interested in the effect, I was interested in the cause. So I traveled east into Ukraine and I just, you know, I met some interesting people and, I, and my eyes were absolutely uh, pried uh, wide open. And uh, it was then that I said, okay, I've got to come back. And uh, I guess it was sort of like a full circle coming back to, you know, those, those memories that I had as a, as a teenager and seeing you know, what the Soviet Union was and where, what happened to it and, you know, I got to finally experience it. After experiencing so long on paper and on television, I got to see it for real. And I fell in love with the place. I mean, we had a certain uh, connection together. You know, even, I don't know, I, I don't feel like stripping, but see, I've even got my Yuri Gagarin t-shirt on, first man in space. So, uh -huh. so I remember him as, like, you know, being 12 years old or something like yeah. that and, uh, when he died. So. I have to say first, I think it's very important for all documentary photographers, photojournalists, whatever. Art is fine art, any photographer, but you, you have to have something to say and you have to have a vision, I think, of how you want to say that. And I was kind of lucky because in a way I just sort of stumbled upon in, into something in Ukraine and Russia where you know, I, I felt an immediate connection to it, but I had no idea what I wanted to do. I just knew I wanted to be there and I didn't discover it until I got there. I sort of got involved in, in Ukraine was a project called The Underclass and His Bosses, which was about, uh, I had befriended some cops and befriended some, uh, some mid-level criminal gangs. And this story, as I, I, as I began working on it, I sort of realized that it was more of a metaphor for what I was thinking how Ukraine and Russia are today. And so I think at the top of the pyramid, sort of, I see my work as a pyramid, and at the very top is sort of a very simple phrase. Uh, phrase. And my work is about power and the wounds it inflicts on those who don't have it. And so going from that statement, I'm able to sort of, you know, look for other work that can fit back into there. And it was that underclass and its bosses project that sort of got the ball rolling, you know. And because uh, it's a very violent, brutal society and power is the ultimate uh, currency there. It's not necessarily monetary, it's about, it's about the power, who controls it and who doesn't, um, and, how, and how you wield it upon those. Uh, who don't have it. So for me, everything I did since then kind of will, will always fit into that. And after I did the underclass and its bosses, I worked on a project in Chernobyl. And uh, that was also an interesting project because everybody knows Chernobyl. Uh, and rightly so, they should know about Chernobyl. But what I was interested in is since there was so much work done in Chernobyl before, like Paul Fusco is probably got the most definitive uh, project on Chernobyl called Chernobyl Legacy. Uh, I didn't want to sort of attack it in the same way that he did. And my, my question for doing Chernobyl was very simple, which was, what was life like in a post-atomic world? And so I just went without sort of having any preconceived ideas of what the place would be like. And I went and ended up staying about three months, uh, sort of living amongst the area, just getting to know the people and, uh, you know, quite 
interested to discover that it is just an ongoing society like any place. You know, people still live there, they have to live their lives and, and they move on. And that was a very, um, you know, successful project for me, you know. I got uh, a couple of grants out of that, a World Press Award for one photograph that I took from there. Um, and uh, and the, the book also came out of it. So. And then from Chernobyl, uh, sort of moved on into Russia, working on, uh, again, this, you know, this question of power and uh, how did this... So for me, I started asking myself, well, where does this power come from? And doing, living in Russia and being in Russia and sort of understanding, uh, you know, a Russian mindset. Uh, I did some research into the Gulag and the history of, you know, Russia as essentially a, a prison society. And, you know, you can say, well, these are all sort of grand deal statements, you know, but how do you photograph, pinpoint that? That's kind of the area where I like to be. I like to kind of think of an idea and then have to go photograph that. But then you have to find something that you can actually visualize. So, you know, when I went off to, in Russia, I went to the areas that were sort of settled by um, convict prisoners. I photographed uh, public works projects that were uh, uh, built by slave labor. You know, for instance, St. Petersburg is a city entirely built by slave labor. Czarist times, and, you know, and so if, it, if it wasn't for slaves and prisoners, you know, Siberia and three quarters of Russia wouldn't exist. So, you know, I started photographing uh, survivors of the Gulag or descendants of the Gulag. I went to the old Gulag camps and went to these, uh, you know, public works projects initiated under Stalin that were all built. So these were all kind of ways to visualize, you know, just that very basic question of power. And now that I'm moving on from that, uh, I'd like to take my Chernobyl projects, which I've always seen as sort of a, a trinity of three, and part one was Chernobyl, part two is I'm going to go to Kazakhstan, which is the largest uh, area where the Soviets tested uh, their atomic bomb, which is a natural progression, and then the third part will be the South Pacific, so we'll get me you know, completely out of the, uh, the Slavic hemisphere. Yeah, that's... Uh, it's a tough image for me to reconcile with because at first I didn't really like it. I mean, it's not an image that I think I would shoot because it is so strong as an individual, and I think my work needs to be seen as as a whole, as a body, and that was sort of like a very specific single image. Um, the other thing that kind of bothered me about it was when people see it, you know, they go, "Oh, it's so funny! Oh, isn't it funny?" And it kind of irritated me because I said, well, no, it's not funny. I mean, if you really look at the picture, I mean, it's, it says a lot about a state of affairs in Chernobyl right now. And, uh, you know, people sort of see it as, as a one-off joke. But, you know, I, I came to sort of loosen up a little bit and say, well, yeah, you know, it is kind of funny, actually. You know, he's trying to save his vodka. And uh, to me, it sort of reeks of desperation. You know, you're, <laughs> yeah. you're that desperate that you've got to, you know, save a, you know, an ounce of, of vodka. But... That was sort of a lot of work. I had first gone into, as I said, I was in Orange Revolution in 2004, and just after New Year's 2004, 2005, I went up to Chernobyl for the very first time, just to, as a pure tourist, just to see, and I had met this this uh, guy, Sergei, and we spent the uh, day together, you know, I took some pictures of him, and we were hanging out, and of course, had some vodka, and he said, come back, come back, please, I want to see you again. But yeah, okay, and he was a very fascinating, Incredibly, one of the best storytellers I've ever come across. And then we were exactly the same age too, which which I, I thought was kind of interesting, you know. And I, you know, put myself in his shoes. I'm like, wow, you know, we're both born in the same year, you know. Like how our lives would be different if he was born in Toronto and I was born in in Chernobyl. That would be me. Um, so yeah, I, I put the effort into wanting to get to know him, and I genuinely liked him. He invited me back, so. I came back to Ukraine about six months later in the, in the late spring, and I went to Chernobyl, and I went to see Sergei, I brought him some photographs, and he liked them, he said, let's go, we'll have a picnic on the riverside. Okay, and he brought some friends, and I knew he was going to get drunk, and, uh, you know, I wasn't really looking for photos of getting him, you know, wasted, but, you know, alcohol is 